Hey, hey, it's Rebecca, and you are listening to Resilient by Design. Today, I get to have a really insightful conversation with Andrea Freeman. She is a coach, but before she became a coach, what I find really interesting is her path. She is a serial entrepreneur from a very young age. She Honestly, she said she started her first business when she was 12. Uh, Then she talks in this podcast about an incredible business that she started when she was 17. Um, And that basically three businesses and a lot of learning later, she was hosting red carpet celebrities in her event planning business. But she felt unfulfilled. And so she told herself there had to be a better way. How many of us have thought that about our businesses? We're just chugging along and just trying to get through the next project to the next project to, oh, is it, is it holidays yet? Is it summer break? And often we say to ourselves, at least I have, there has got to be a better way. My business is not fulfilling me to the extent that I had hoped it would when I started out. This conversation goes a little deep, so I hope you're ready for it. I really enjoyed this It was very insightful. She speaks right to the heart of what is it that drives our business forward, and it's us. So enjoy this episode. I can't wait to hear what you think of it. All right. (laughs) I'm Rebecca Hay, and I've built a successful interior design business by trial and error, podcasts, online courses, and so many freaking books. Over the last decade, I've grown from an insecure student to having false starts to careers, and now I'm finally in the place where I want to be. Throughout my journey, it's been pretty obvious that I'm passionate about business and helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Each week, I'll share tangible takeaways from my own experience and the experiences of other badass women to help you build your confidence and change your business. Are you as tired as I am working in a bubble? I mean, shoot, it's time to maybe socially distance with other people. That is why I love coming to the collective workspace. If you are someone who is looking for a little bit of stimulation, a lot of beauty, the collective workspace is a really great place to go. It is a co-working space for designers, architects, and builders in Toronto, and they're opening a second location This spring, they have flex workspace and offices starting at $120 a month. There's boardrooms, a podcast booth, which is where I am right now, concierge storage, and a trade-only design library. You can find out more or if you want to book a tour, go to thecollectivetio.com. Okay, here we are today with Andrea Freeman. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Andrea. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is awesome. It's always, I love these, um, I love these episodes where I get to interview someone who's not a designer, but has so much great wisdom and insight. Uh, So why don't you, I guess, start by just sharing who you are? Okay, sure. So I am a mindful business coach. And what that means is that I work with creative entrepreneurs, usually female, but a couple of brave men, um, who are interested in harnessing the power of their mindset to be able to scale their businesses to six figures or beyond, or really create, because not always about the number for everybody, really create that lifestyle of freedom, what it means to be able to be a business owner and create balance and alignment in all parts of our lives. So that's what I work with business owners to do. And how I got here is, um, you know, I was bitten by the entrepreneurial bug kind of early in life. At like 12 years old, I started marketing and monetizing a babysitting service. And, uh, you know, I've had a couple of other iterations of business ownership. I owned a catering company, uh, which transformed into event design. So, you know, I feel like I resonate with, with your crowd here from the design perspective. But that really, that experience because in that uh, in that business, I was designing events for red carpet celebrities and socialites and huge corporate clients. So that's 
the business where I experienced the most success and also the most misalignment where I went off the path, where I felt more disconnected to my vision or my original vision than ever before, where I kind of outgrew my vision and then had to say like, who am I now and where am I going and what what's my vision for the future? So that is really what led me to doing what I do now, to just be able to support people in maintaining or reestablishing that kind of alignment for themselves in, in their lives and their businesses. Oh, that's that really resonating with me. I love that you say that because like when you start out in any industry, in any career, you do have a certain vision, but it does, it can change. And I think for a lot of us, it does change. And there's a resistance to that change. I don't know if you see that, but it's like, I'm just noticing it in my own self. Like when I started off in interior design, I wanted one thing, but now it's kind of shifted. And in doing and living and breathing this business, I'm starting to see different aspects that I that I love. I'm liking the business side. I'm liking the teaching, the giving back side. Uh, back side, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to catch myself <laughs> saying something. I'm like, oh my God, why did I say it that way? Uh, oh, so good. Okay. So you are a coach, which means you work with creative entrepreneurs. Yep. And um, I guess let's just start off by talking about that idea of like, what are most people actually? I'm curious. Most people, when they come to you, what are they looking for help with? Like, what are most entrepreneurs that you see struggling with? Mm, yeah, so many things. So, uh, people tend to be in one of two places when they find me. Usually, they are just starting out in business and wanting to do it very intentionally, wanting to create something that's aligned, hearing the stories of, you know, heartache, blood, sweat, and tears, uh, you know, what it means to be in the minutia of owning a business, but not wanting to fall into that trap. So, they're taking a kind of intentional path. Or, they have somewhat scaled their business. They've experienced some success. They're some like, you know, three to five years into business. Uh, they've hit some some pretty important goals, some pretty important milestones and maybe even revenue markers. And they're wanting to scale bigger. They're wanting to grow their team. They're wanting to evolve into more of a CEO role. And they're noticing that the same things keep tripping them up. No matter how hard they try to evolve their relationship to money or their relationship to time, uh, it's not scaling and it's taking a lot of work. They're at a point where they're ready to stop working so hard. Like they just know that there has to be an easier way. And so I basically work with people in either of those two places to to get the same results, to really own who they are, how easy it could be, um, what their vision really is, and completely bring it into alignment so that like they're fully integrated into their business, like really, you know, mind, body, spirit, and not in a very like super woo-woo way, but in a very holistic looking at all parts of what am I think? What's what am I thinking? Where did that thinking come from? How do I transform that to produce the results that I am really committed to producing? So yeah, yeah so that's where like, I find people. That's so interesting. I think a lot of uh, a lot of us as business owners tend to hold ourselves back without realizing it. It sounds like that's what you're saying. It's and you can kind of work with them. How much of growing your business and developing um, developing it is mindset. Oh, so I'd say it's like 80% mindset and 20% <laughs> oh my hard God, work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most people focus on the hard work part and oh have no concept of the mindset. And I feel like I'm just at the, I'm just starting. I'm at the tip of the iceberg of learning about mindset. It's so amazing because, I, you know, and I don't think that this is like any fault of our own as business owners, because I really do believe that the, the world at large kind of teaches people to look outside of themselves for answers, to be able to pick up a new book, to p take a new course, all of that, and find some new system or strategy or tactic that will help us achieve the satisfaction that we're looking for. And so we're taught from a young age to do, 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 do. And the thing is, we are human beings. And so when we are like not focusing on the feeling or the experience that we're having as a business owner, who we're being with our teammates, with our colleagues, with our clients, 
that affects everything. Like if you get that relationships really drive business, then it is essential to look at who you are being in your business. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so true. I mean, I started working with a business coach about a year ago and I was like, okay, like, just tell me, like, I need, I've got, I got to figure out my team. And I was just like, come on, let's just get this done. And she was like, tell me about I don't know, your past. Tell me about your family. And I was like, oh, I feel like I'm paying you for this. Like, this is such a waste of time. And like the achiever in me, and I'm sure you see this all the time, was like, seriously, can you just tell me what I need to do? Like, this is ridiculous. And then, of course, she got me talking and I'm like in tears. I'm like crying because of like some personal trauma I didn't even know was traumatizing me and affecting the way that I saw things and affecting the way that I showed up. And I was like, oh, my God, I did not expect it. And it was very eye opening because I read a lot of books. I listen to a lot of podcasts. But until you actually go through that emotional, I'm not saying everyone has to cry, but (laughs) but it was like oh, my mindset and why I do the things I do is so much more deeply rooted in me than it is in the business itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just from human evolution perspective, like we all basically have those formative years as children where we decide how the world is, like how other people are, how we are, how we're going to be in it. And so we carry those ways of being forward, you know, and we, we have strengths that we develop because of those ways of being. And we have kind of like compensations and ways that we're covering up for and trying to protect ourselves. So when we really get in there and look at all of that. I mean, I have worked with business owners who have tried, you know, every kind of marketing and like nothing is working for marketing just doesn't work for me, they say. And I'm like, well, that's going to be really difficult to make profitable. So let's look at that. And when we really get in there and find out that somehow this goes back to a decision when their parents were divorcing at four years old and they decided they couldn't have what they want in life because dad was leaving, even though, you know, I wanted him to stay like, Who would ever logically make that connection, right? Like we would never in a million years, I don't care how many books you read, would ever think that my four-year-old conversation is running this part of my life. Like it's not logical. It makes no sense. And these are the, you know, the power and the tools of working one with someone who's outside of yourself. Like we're Mm -hmm. not in the game of your business as a coach, but also just outside of your life experience and able to guide you in a very safe way to those places where you can clear out that clutter. It does, like you said, it doesn't always have to look like tears, uh, you know, but to be able to have those reflections and insights so that you can really rapidly produce results that you're interested in. Totally. It's funny to hear you say that. My parents separated when I was five and I used to always say like, didn't affect me. Like, it's just what I know. I don't know any different. And now it's like as a business owner and doing self-reflection, I look back and I don't know exactly what it is. I probably haven't done enough deep work, but I'm like, yeah, no, I feel like that's probably affected me. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. (laughs) I'm like, I'm so well adjusted. I totally, it's just what I know. It's just my life. For sure it affected me. I've just like buried it so deep down. Yeah. Oh man, my parents for everything. (laughs) (laughs) How do I not screw up my own children? That's all I can think of. Like I have two little kids and every time I do this work and I think back to my childhood, I'm like, oh my God, I don't know. I don't even know the answer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's the right. Guide them towards this kind of work and, you know, let them see that they have their own answers inside. Okay. So it is a little woo woo to some people who are a little bit more of like of the achievement mindset. How do you leverage that? So like, how do you leverage that mindset to kind of be successful, level up, scale your company, start a new endeavor, whatever it might be? Yeah. So I say that you can't outperform your mindset, right? So the results that you produce are directly related to the actions that you're taking. And the actions that you're taking are directly related to the thoughts that you're thinking, the things that you believe and the things that you're telling yourself. So if you want to, you know, 
especially it's the end of the year, right? If you have goals for next year, if you have things that you're really out to accomplish, then going to work on your mindset, whatever that looks like for you, is just going to pay dividends. Um, I like to say, it's like kind of a little tagline that I have, that you can let your personal evolution fuel your business revolution. So the more committed you are to the work that is really truly before the work, right? It's not, it doesn't look like doing, it's getting in there and looking at your thoughts and giving yourself time to be still and have new design ideas, new creative uh, ideas, new systems and structures and practices to put in place for your business that will only strengthen the foundation. Very often we get kind of stuck on the hamster wheel of operating our business, of being in it and running it and all the doing. But we also very rarely do our most elegant thinking when we're running on the hamster wheel. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) jumping off, giving ourselves some time to pause. I feel like 2020 has been the year of talking about self-care and self-reflection and really, truly allowing ourselves to be still and hear our heart's inner callings for ourselves you know, not only in our businesses, but, you know, how that works in our lives and what we want that to look like as far as balance, I think is the most important work that we can do when we're getting into uh, getting ready to go into a new cycle. So then I agree. I mean, what, but what do people do? So I guess I'm, uh, apart from hiring a coach who can walk them through it, like what are some things that the average entrepreneur could do to kind of, work on that and understand how their mindset is affecting them. Like one of the things that it's not a tactic, but one of the things I started to pay attention to is when I get anxiety, like when I'm starting to feel really anxious, Mm -hmm. I stop and I'm like, okay, Rebecca, what is causing me anxiety? Like what is causing me stress? What there's something that has happened that has triggered this feeling before I just like take it out on the world. It's usually when I'm driving in my car because I'm like in solitude and I'm like, why am I feeling anxious? And I try, like, I don't always come up with the answer, but I try to self-reflect and I try to think, okay, right. Like I'm anxious because the client is unhappy. And when people, when I think people are unhappy with me, it affects me, right? Like that recently happened. (laughs) That recently happened to me. So it's like very top of mind, right? Even though it was something that was out of my control, I didn't cause the pain to the client, but their anger was taken out on me. And so I internalized it. And then as a result, I felt anxious in everything else I did that day. Mm. So like, I don't know if that's a tactic. That's just me, I guess, self-reflecting. Like what can people do to kind of understand where their mind, I say, I feel like a lot of people are like, yeah, 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 yeah. Mindset's everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they just go back to their daily life. Um, And they don't really see how, you know, they're the way that they are perceiving an event or their business or the way they're behaving or acting is might, might be holding them back. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, so often when something happens and especially something that's a triggering event, um, we get caught up in the like replaying, right? Like what happened? What could I have done? And a little bit like we can go down this kind of rabbit hole of overthinking. And I feel like when you notice that you are in overwhelm, when you notice that you're in overthink, when you notice that body sensation of like anxiety and just not sure what it's about, first of all, noticing it is the first step, right? Like you can't, some people just are numb to it. So just be grateful that you're noticing it, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I start to notice that, I also pretty quickly behind that kind of have some default things that I usually pick up and say to myself, right? Like, and for the achievers, and I am one of you, like I am right there, like I can muscle through, I can work harder for longer than most people. And it used to be a point of pride for me. And there was a moment when I decided in my business, and for me, it happened after I became a mom, where I decided I need to to be much more effective and much more efficient in my business, that I was not willing to sacrifice the family time for the the goals and the achievements in my business, right? That they, the two needed to play a little more nicely together. And so I had to get out of the overwhelm and the overthink and the 
and back to business a lot faster, right? So for me, what I started working with was affirmations. Like I would notice the feeling, I would notice uh, the trigger. And instead of reaching for the old thing that I would tell myself, which is that like, I can do this. I know I can push through. I would reach for something that just gently nudged me more into alignment with my goals than just muscling through and just like hard work that, that yes, we can do that. But like, I'm interested in something much more elegant and much more efficient and much more graceful for a business that feels as good as it looks. And so for me, I would remind myself, I mean, the very first affirmation I ever worked with was I'm divinely guided and protected. Like, so I would give into that there is something bigger than myself, that there is something, you know, at play, even though this isn't working out the way I necessarily wanted it to or ideally envisioned. There's something at play here and there's something for me to learn. And there's something that is going to allow me to grow as a business owner and to evolve into the next phase of whatever that looks like for me. And that kind of dwelling in that space allowed me to not have to have every answer, to not have to understand every situation, to not have to take on my client's emotions because what their reactions are, and I mean, event design is high pressure, like like very much I know, you know, similar to what you guys deal with because it, there's the stakes are high. I mean, I would almost say that the stakes are probably even higher on your hand. Like this is permanent, you know, what's going to, yeah. what you're creating, that lasting impact. And it can be a really empowering way to work with people, to create spaces that transform their relationships, that transform their homes, to all of that. And people can often see that as so high stakes, so important that they can act a little funny, right? Mm -hmm. And that all of that, has nothing to do with me. How they react to stress, how they handle upset has nothing to do with me. As difficult as it can be to deal with in the moment, I have to empower my clients to, to own their reactions and their responses. I have to have a measured response to it, right? So I have to be able to come to it from a place of clarity and commitment to the end goal, which is that this entire experience is enjoyable, not just a satisfying, you know, design, um, but that they get to be the best version of themselves throughout the process, right? So who do I have to be to to pull that out of people? If I'm triggered and then thrown into upset and then going to respond in a not pretty way, that's not going to produce that result, right? So I have to always bring myself back to who am I committed to being with people everywhere I go in the world. And so affirmations, huge tool. Um, you know, that's something that you can do kind of on your own to get started. Meditation, um, exercise and movement. You know, these are all things that we can pick up and use as part of our tool belt. And then, you know, if you start working with a coach, if you decide you want some support along that journey, I mean, we have all kinds of, I mean, I am a certified hypnotherapist. I really can get in there with people and create like new ways of thinking that are even faster than maybe taking it to your journal. Yes, take it to your journal too, but also, you know, use this other tool, right? Wow, that's so awesome. That's so many helpful tips. I actually was, as you were talking, I wrote this down. I loved how you said uh, you want to have a business that feels as good as it looks on the outside. Mm. Which to me, I'm like, oh, yes, because I feel like designers, especially stagers, decorators, creative entrepreneurs, we are so obsessed with how things look because we're in a visual medium and it's Instagram. Man, it's Instagram. <laughs> it's like, I love Instagram and I hate it. But it's, it's that concept of you see this person on Instagram and their team and the work they're doing and the publicity you're, they're getting. And sure, you fall into that comparison trap and it seems like it's this amazing thing. So someone might look at what I'm doing in my design business and be like, wow, like it looks amazing. But then in self-reflection, does it feel to me as good as it looks to others on the outside? 
Not yeah. always. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge, I found myself in that exact place in 2015, like I said, right after my daughter was born, where I just got to, I mean, if you looked at my list of clients, like, like I said, red carpet celebrities, huge uh, corporations, socialites, like, you know, from the outside, it looked like everything was going great. And I felt deeply disconnected from my business and what was important to me. And at that time, it wasn't like I had no purpose in my life. I definitely knew that I wanted to create, that I wanted to inspire. I wanted to bring communities together. Like I knew that I wanted to do those things. But when I really like took a step back and looked at what was going on, I was just skimming the surface of that purpose. I was trying to be everything to everybody. I was looking around the market. What's everybody else offering? I was doing so many things without going deep on the things that were the most satisfying for me. So when we're looking at like, I should be doing this, I have to do that, like that's how we're running our business, it's very, very easy because we're high achievers and we're driven by, you know, the results and the way that it looks on Instagram. That's a huge, huge uh, driver of pushing people into this place, right? But it's also kind of the good news because at least for me, it was an opportunity to completely reinvent myself in my business. You know, I, as someone who really like to create deep, meaningful connection with my clients. And we would work on design projects for a year or more sometimes. It was important to me to, um, you know, to establish that connection really quickly, right? Like after we said, yes, we signed on the dotted line, we're going to work together. I would always send a gift. And for years, that gift was Tiffany champagne glasses. And I was like, yes, this makes so much sense. I'm a luxury planner. It's a luxury item, right? And then I was like, oh, just that surface level isn't cutting it anymore, right? Like I am going for deep and meaningful connection. And so I completely overhauled what I was doing there. And so now people weren't thanking me on Instagram with this like very shiny object. Now they were getting a a candle that was um, made by, you know, like one of those organizations that teaches women in Africa to run their own businesses. And, you know, it was very mission driven. It was, it started to be, you know, like everything was organic. There were organic bath salts and, you know, chocolate. And so it was still very nice and, and very luxurious, but it was connected to the things that mattered to me. And that actually, truthfully, mattered to my clients because I do attract people who are interested in sustainability, who are interested in heartfelt connection. Because I, you know, at that time in my event planning business, stopped even promising perfect parties. Like I stopped promising perfection and started really talking about what would happen when things would go wrong because things always at some point in the evening, it's real life. Like things happen, right? Someone accidentally trips on the cord. Someone, you know, forgets to deliver something. Some delivery gets delayed. Like that all happens. So here's how I will guide you through what could potentially be upsetting in a way that you might not even know an upset happened. And here is what you can count on me for so that you can stay deeply invested and part of the experience of your party, right? And that was a huge shift for me. I was really worried when I was thinking about changing that messaging, when I was overhauling the brand, when I was changing up the gift about, oh my gosh, am I making a mistake? Like I'm I'm going off the beaten path. I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. Is this going to work? And what I found is that it worked so much better than anything I had been doing. I had from that point on, my most profitable years in my business. I had more clients referring me. I had more venues referring me. Um, You know, it just, it worked, it worked better than I ever could have imagined that it would work. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I work with my clients to really be able to discern what are the things, what are the shifts that you're going to make in your business that are going to 10x your results, right? And in a way that are 
deeply, deeply aligned with your core values, your mission statement in your business, and everything that's important for, for you in all areas of your life. Wow. Okay. Andrea, you just hit on so many things. And I'm like, yes, and that, and yes. And I'm like, keep going. Oh my God. I don't even know how to, I have to unpack that because there's a few things that I want to highlight the what you talked about there. First of all, I love how you talked about the overachiever or the ch- achiever, let's mm-hmm. say, who is spread super thin, trying to do it all with perfection, but keeps doing it because they achieve it. Mm-hmm. And I think that is it's really resonating with me because we just had our um, we do an end of year review with my team. It's the new thing I started last year, which has been great to get them on board and set goals and talk about our core values and all of that. But um, and I also prior to that, I did one on ones. And what came up out of the one on one when I asked my team to give me feedback was a lot of them said, you spread yourself too thin, you know, you take on too much. But then one of the girls on my team said something that really stuck, which is exactly what you just said. She said, because she's also a bit of an achiever. So she sees that. And she said, she's like, she's like, well, if I had any feedback for you, it would be to like, take it, take it slower and do fewer things. But I know that 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 isn't really congruent with your goals and you achieve things anyway. So I understand why you do it. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting to hear her say that, which is what you just said. And I think a lot of us are like that. We take on so much and everyone else around us is like, you're crazy. How do you do it? You're And everybody else is like, I could never do that. Mm-hmm. And I think, well, obviously you could do it if you wanted to. That's how I think. But I always... I achieve what I set out to do. The problem is I'm then so drained, so exhausted, and not like really at the core of who I am and my values. I'm not necessarily always, um, and I think of this, a lot of designers probably do this. You get so caught up in, like you say, like oh, working with the clients, the contractors, the trades, the invoicing, the branding, the design, the everything, when maybe your heart is in, oh, I don't know how to describe it, but like your heart and what fills you up is not all of the things. Right. It's not all of the things. And I'm starting to go on this, my own journey, which everyone in the world is watching. Not everyone in the world, ha, fancy myself so popular. (laughs) But I mean, the people on the outside, (laughs) I realized what that sounded like. I mean, the people who know me or the people who are following along in my journey see me. Now I'm starting to teach designers, right? And show them how to run design businesses or what I've done. And it fills me up to a different degree. Mm -hmm. But I'm also still trying to run the design business. And I'm also still trying to do and and grow it and do all the things. Oh my God, it was so, oh my God. Girl, I need your help. Um, (laughs) The other thing that I really like that you talked about, and I think we should talk in more detail. I want to know how you did this. Because event planning, from the way you describe running these events, and we've all been to them. Some of us have even had weddings of our own, right? And we've had big events where it's not, things are going to happen. It sounds very similar to a renovation. Mm. This is something that I'm personally, my team and I are struggling with right now. And I know most of the designers in in my courses, in my groups, in my Facebook groups, we're always talking about this is guiding the client through the messy parts of that renovation to the end. And and it just, it's still a struggle. And it seems like no matter how many gifts I give them or how many flowers I bring to their house, they are still frustrated with us, even though we're not the one who left the sawdust in the alleyway. It was the millwork company, but it's their expectations. And as much as I talk about, you gotta set their expectations. The way you just described how you how you changed not only your communication with your client, but just your overall, I don't know, business model in a way. Like how can designers learn from you and that experience? Like how can we make, like I love the sounds of that, but in my head I'm like, I'll never get there. With yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely possible. So this is something that's a really big part of my group coaching program, actually, where we really get into the experience of our brand and what that is for our clients, what we want it to be for ourselves, but what the 
the client truly experiences as a result of working for us and what our really special sauce is and all, right? Because there are, you know, if we're in a design field, chances are our market's pretty saturated, right? Like, and that's good news because that lets us know that, you know, we're not blazing a new trail. We're not trying to sell the world something it doesn't necessarily think it wants. There's opportunity for for people, right? And it can start to feel a little inauthentic, a little cookie cutter, right? So how do we guide people through that experience in a way that's true to us, that's true to who we are, and that satisfies what the client is looking for? And so for me, that looks like a an enormous amount of communication up front about letting them know what the process will look like. Um, I let them into the back end of my design timeline um, and, you know, let them see without being able to take it over. They can view it. <laughs> they could see what's getting done. They can let me know their questions. Um, I have them sign off on every part of the project. Um, and then, you know, it's really about empowering them to be in communication too, right? That I can't read their mind if somehow this is feeling incongruent for them, if somehow it's not working for them. And so I have regular check-ins set up. And this happens pretty naturally in the design process for you guys as well, I'm sure, where you touch base with them just to see like, okay, this is the next milestone that's coming. This is, But I also get really personal with them because I understand that this is an event that brings with it, I mean, more emotion than most events, right? Like, um, especially the weddings. Um, so what's, what is going on personally? What's going on at work? Do you have big deadlines that I need to know about? Are you planning on moving anytime soon? Are you going on a big vacation? You know, because here's what the next phase of the project looks like. And if I need to adjust when things are due or when I get you samples of things or whatnot, then I need to know in advance so that I can make that happen for you in a way that works. <laughs> Totally. Oh my God. That's so, so interesting. I realize I'm like, I'm not really digging that deep with my clients. I'm just trying to like come do my job, get out of their hair. But as a result, they have a lot going on in their lives. Right. And that a lot of that, it's, I, I actually just interviewed um, Mindy Applebaum, who has, um, it's called luxury move management. She, she moves people like from old houses when they buy a new house, they help them sell their furniture here in Toronto. And she talked about this exact thing where you just never know what's going on in someone else's life that could affect them and and cause them to react in any any particular way, right? Whether it's joyous, whether it's stress, whether it's lashing out, whatever it might be. Um, they've hired us to do this service and we really are very independent of that. That's what she does. Now they come in, they move, they leave. We're in our clients' lives for like a year, or right. more. Right. So we really should be paying more attention to what's going on. You know, what are their big deadlines? I and mean, we get emails from the client saying, so sorry, I didn't get back to you, you know, dealing with this merger or something. And it's like, oh, wow, that sounds like that's probably pretty stressful. Um, and if I would maybe known some of those things in advance, it could have helped us instead of us getting frustrated that the client has responded to the revisions request. Because here we are thinking that we're the most important thing in that client's life. <laughs> <laughs> which obviously we're not. <laughs> and, and that's one of the things for me that was a driving core value um, that I even more deeply ingrained in my business and part of my practices in 2015 when I overhauled everything. It was no longer going to work to be transactional with my clients. It was about being deeply, deeply personal with them. And not everybody's up for that, right? Like not everybody wants to be best friends with their designers. And now, I, you know, some of them were really close when we go through the process and then we're out of each other's lives because they're onto a new phase of life. That's fine. I'm really good at saying goodbye. <laughs> and for the ones that want to be like involved in the experience of planning this thing, whether it's a redesign of their home or some kind of event or whatever your business is, right? That you help people walk through that time in their lives with grace and ease and compassion. For me, I couldn't imagine doing it any other way. Now I've transitioned into coaching and 
you know, uh, there are a handful of events that my team is wrapping up, but mostly I'm squarely focused on coaching and that works for me, but I am walking people through this process in their businesses in the very same way. I am not, it didn't work for me to only look at the business and not look at the rest of their life and not know what's going on in all parts because it's going to it all impact the bottom line. It's going to all impact their performance. It's going to all impact who they're being in their business. So I want to, and I welcome knowing all of it. I want to know that, you know, something happened over here in your relationship with your mom or, you know, that you're planning on having a second child or, you know, all the things that you are thinking about doing. And I want to know about the things not even what's just going on right now, but the things 10 years from now that you would like to be your legacy in your business, the things that you would like to do. I mean, I have a promise to the world to help 10,000 female entrepreneurs scale their business to multi six figures or beyond because the data is in when female entrepreneurs are empowered and you know wealthy they give back more than their male counterparts they donate their time they donate their money to charitable causes i want to be a part of that i want to be part of that ripple effect right so it's really important when i bring in a new client that i know what are the causes that align with their values what are the things they want to be able to do do you want to start your own charitable giving foundation like Think big, and then we can plan backwards to figure out how to make that happen. Oh, I love that. I mean, I always say set goals and then work backwards to figure out how you can achieve them. I I learned this from somebody else, but I never really thought of it that way. Like, that's really awesome. I think that's really awesome. I'm so curious. How did you make, how did you start coaching? Like, from event design... Yeah. <laughs> to where you are now. Cause like, it's interesting. Cause it's, you know, like I'm curious because I'm starting to help designers, right. With like marketing and the process and like running a business and all the things that I've learned, I'm now really loving giving back and sharing. So I'm just curious, like someone who's similar, like how did you make that sort of transition or how did that start? It's a fair question. And I actually feel like I've been called to do this my whole life. So I, When I was 16 years old, I worked at a summer camp out in Kansas City. Um, So it was halfway across the country from the home that I had always known. And I was out there for a month. I'd never been away from home for so long. And I went out there to work at this summer camp that was for kids with disabilities. And uh, I chose to do it. It was part of the Girl Scouts. And I chose to do it because I have a sister who has a disability. And I wanted to be able to to give back to this community, right? Like Girl Scouts is all about giving back. So I did that. And then I came home and I was like, hmm, my hometown doesn't have one of these. Like, let me create one. So then for a project to earn my gold award, which is like the highest award you can get in Girl Scouts, I created that summer camp in my hometown. It went on to run for another 10 years. The local Girl Scout Council took it on. Um, I trained them how to put it together every, I mean, like I turned it over to them. And then, so I'm 17 years old and I'm like, wow, what do I, like, I like doing this project, right? But like, I can't do summer camp all year round. What's like this? So I went to school for education and I could not have been more misguided in my choice, right? Like it turns out (laughs) that like, (laughs) that I liked being of service. I liked creating the systems and the structures and building the team. I really liked the entrepreneurial aspect of this project, but I didn't know that, right? And I, Mm -hmm. event design wasn't even a thing I could have imagined you could do. I knew nobody who worked in that field. I, it never occurred to me. So teaching was like, I knew teachers, right? I knew nurses. I, this, these are the people I knew. So I chose to become a teacher. And three weeks into being a teacher, I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? This is so not for me. And so I did that. I finished that year. You know, I couldn't just escape. Um, But I started (laughs) to do a lot of deep internal work. So I'm 25 years old at that time. And I started reading like every self-help book I could get. I started going to all kinds of seminars. And I mean, just like I started working with coaches, I actually started my catering company when I was still teaching because I was just... Okay. You are like the most entrepreneurial guest I've had on this podcast. Like... (laughs) 
12 years old, 17 years old, 25. I was not reading self-help books at 25. I was like partying in Spain. I was like, you're awesome. (laughs) I mean, I was partying too. I was definitely still also a 25-year-old. And I actually got very sick. I I think that in that position of like keeping going, like talk about the higher achiever in me, right? Like I'm not going to quit and I'm going to get through this. Anybody could do anything for a year, I was saying at that time. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I would never tell anybody that now, right? <laughs> but I thought it was important to push through and I got very, very sick. And actually, that's how the culinary thing ended up coming about because I wanted to heal myself with food. I didn't want to turn to medicine um, or traditional Western medicine. And so long story short, I have always had kind of coaches in my life. In that year when I was 25, I dated a dating coach. I then went on to work for a leadership development company and planned all their courses in transformation that were around the world happening globally. So I was doing like 40 courses a year for like somewhere between 40 and 400 people at a time. Um, So learning about the foundation of business, the systems and structures and what it really takes to keep an organization moving, building a team, all of that, but also firmly grounded in the deep, juicy inner work of looking inward at who I'm being and how that serves the world. So I feel like now I've arrived in a place that allows me to use all of these parts of myself that I was developing that on their own felt very incomplete. But now I get to fuse my ability to develop curriculum and the teacher side of me with my ability to look at who I'm being and inspire people to look at who they're being with my experience as a business owner and kind of put together my own special little concoction of how I can help to empower the people that resonate with me to live their life in alignment, their business in alignment with like a bigger promise than just a business core mission or just a business core values, but something that might not even be achieved in your lifetime. Like really living beyond just for the self, just for the identity, just for the ego and beyond even my family and beyond my hometown, but for something for the world. It's like you've taken all of the, <clears throat> all of your strengths in different realms and kind of slowly over years pulled them all together into this one thing. It's really cool to see. And I think anyone who's listening, I mean, people listening may not want to be a coach, but even in your own business, there's probably like my takeaway from that is we all have unique strengths and abilities that we get throughout life and passions. And there's and you have to look at where those strengths are so that you can pull that together in your business. I think it's so, so interesting too. Like I always wanted to go to teacher's college. So I wanted to be a teacher. And then I taught in Spain as like a trial before before applying to teachers college. And I had the same experience where I was like, yeah, no, this is too much structure. This is not for me. I was like, I can't be a teacher. So I'm going to keep pursuing all the other things. And maybe one day, and I feel like now for me, that that passion for teaching and giving back is kind of all coming to a head now too. And I kind of in a very different way, but it's interesting. It, it, I think it's great to, there's parts of ourselves we don't want to lose. Uh, and you know, I love to sing. So maybe one day I'll be like a singing uh, design coach. I don't know, but there's, you know, there's so many, it fills you up when you get to tap into those strengths and those passions. So it's really cool. Yeah. And I think one of the things too, for me, that was really, it took me a long time to learn was that I actually don't have to monetize everything. Like some Mm -hmm. things can just be for fun and my own pleasure and, you know, hobby and extracurricular and whatever you want to call it. Because a, a little bit of, I think what happened with me with culinary school is that I tried to turn something that I love doing into a profession. And that's not necessarily what I need to do with everything that I love to do. So, um, 
Yeah. I mean, it it did ultimately transition into the event planning stuff, which was definitely beneficial, but like, I don't cook professionally. So, you know, some people would maybe look at it and say like, oh, well, you don't cook professionally. Like that was a misstep. I definitely learned a lot of lessons and, you know, grew a lot from it, but I definitely don't think that I need to turn everything the way that I used to into something Mm -hmm. that's like marketable and that I'm monetizing. Probably because like in school, we're always kind of taught like, where are you, what are you strong at? What are you good at? Okay. That's where you go. Yeah. What are you going to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. One directional, right? You're good at this thing. Then you should do this thing. Like for me, it was always acting. I love being on stage. I loved singing. So I'm like, well, I should go to theater school. Like that's what I should do. And then for some reason, I just like, "Eh, I feel like, I, uh, I don't know. Maybe I was scared. I don't know. And eventually I did attempt the acting thing and I realized, no, that's not really what I want to do with my life. Just because I enjoy that. Uh, and I love singing. And lately I've been singing with like alumni, like chorus groups of my high school. And like, that's just been enough. And it's so fulfilling. I mean, not, I'm not a good enough singer that I could monetize that anyways. But I think I was taught that, you know, well, these are my strengths. And these are the skill sets that seem to be the strongest at the time. Um, because I was young, and you don't know yourself that well. And it was like that. You're right. It's like that idea that, okay, what am I really good at? And how do I monetize? It's not always about that. Well, I think also at such a young age, like the decisions we make about what we're going to do, because at that time, it feels like it has to be for the rest of our lives, right? And it's based on one, really limited life experience, or two, like feedback and things that other people around us are telling us that we're good at, right? Whether that's our teachers and our instructors or our parents or our coaches, like there's usually some people in our lives who are kind of influencing our perception of ourselves. We haven't usually developed the capacity to turn inward for our answers at that age. So a lot of us do miss our life's calling in our early 20s, you know, and we have a windy path, which makes it so much more rich and varied and nuanced when we arrive to the place where we can say like, oh my gosh, I'm multidimensional and there's no way to put it in just one box. I have to bring, I have to draw from all of those life experiences to create something that is uniquely mine, that nobody else can deliver the way that I can deliver it and package it in a way that other people out there can recognize that it's for them. Mm, Yeah, because it is about them, not Mm -hmm. us. Yeah. And so that's what I call energetic marketing. And in my group coaching, again, we work a lot on how to shine that light consistently, make it not seem redundant in our marketing, but make it also very, very clear. So when people tune in to our beautiful, shiny Instagram or our YouTube or whatever you know, happy place we have on the internet to try to cultivate business, that they recognize you as their people, and they can't wait to sit down with you. They can't wait to book that consultation. They're almost a yes before they really walk in the door. Mm. You know, that's when your marketing is like really serving you. That's amazing. So when you work with your, with your, I don't know, clients, students, people. Clients, um, yeah. (laughs) Do you, do you do that type of work? Like, do you kind of look back at, you know, okay, well, your dad always wanted you, I'm just making this up, wanted you to be a doctor, let's say. And so you always felt that's the path you should take. And do you ever look back? Because I think that's a very black and white example of the like the dad who wants the son to be the doctor. But I feel like for a lot of us, it's not so set clear. It's like, yes, yes, I I want you to be what you want to be. Uh, you're very creative, though. Make sure you do something very creative, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. And then you look back, and I, I've never really reflected on this, to be honest. This is just something that you've said that's made me think that do a lot of us sort of look back and say, can, do you work with people to look back and say, okay, here's how I ended up here, and here's what maybe I was influenced because I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really making any sense. I'm, I guess I'm wondering if your past matters and the influences in your past matter in understanding where to take yourself and your business to the future? That's a great question. So yes, our past matters. And the degree to which we need to get in there and look at it is different for every single one of us. Some people are like, absolutely, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Like I already cried on the couch of the therapist. I've Mm -hmm. already taken the seminar, whatever. Like I've done that work, right? I'm not going to force them. Like it's not going to work if they don't want to do that work, right? 
there is always some degree of inner work to do um, that I do with my clients because that's who resonates with me, right? But it's not all about going that far back. Sometimes the path, like the breadcrumbs and the trail will lead us back that far. It's always something that's natural. Um, And we are always looking at um, maybe how those decisions are impacting who we're being now, but it's not necessarily in like the deeply uncovering it, needing to cry (laughs) it out. Like it's not, it's not always so cathartic. Right. And sometimes it is just about the decisions, you know, like we don't have to go back to four years old, but maybe we do go back to like, you know, I, I've always been somebody who like was told by my family, you know, everybody else is doctors, dentists, lawyers, whatever, right? Like those kinds of professions, but I am super, super creative. And I always felt out of alignment, like, uh, you know, and I was pushing back about that. Like, okay, so well, how is the rebel alive and well in your business? And is that serving you? Right. And maybe needing to unpack that. There is usually some form of unpacking, um, but always in the interest of moving forward, being unencumbered by by that way of thinking and the kind of like box we put ourselves in and being able to own all parts of ourselves and move forward more freely. What would you say to the designer who, because I, I see a lot of people in my community, um, you know, trying to figure out their niche or trying to figure out, um, you know, what type of service do I want to offer and not necessarily knowing what to, this is not the right question. Well, not what to do, but like if they should pivot, if they should change. And there's a lot of fear around making big changes in their business. Like what would you say to that designer who is really struggling with, you know, maybe I should stop doing construction and just do decorating or maybe, you know, like th- th- cuz I'm feeling so frustrated with this one arm of my business. Or maybe I should just go into home staging. I had someone in my group yesterday say like, after so much reflection, they've decided they're just going to do staging, but they're scared out of their mind because are they making the right decision? Like how, what would you say to the business owner or designer in my case that is feeling like something has to give, but doesn't know how to figure it out? Mm. So when you're feeling this kind of misalignment is what I would call it, right? Like you've been doing something for some time and it's not feeling quite right anymore. And you have some insight or maybe you don't have insight about why that's feeling off, but you're considering moving in a new direction, right? That's, I'm understanding the question. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so when you find yourself in that place, first celebrate it, because this is the good news, right? When we're okay. noticing that we are out of alignment, this is our opportunity to step more fully into ourselves, to step more fully into our gifts. I truly believe that we all come here for a purpose in this life. And unfortunately, we are not handed that on, you know, some golden tablet when we arrive. It's something that unfolds over our lifetime. So if we can remember, that we have dealt with difficult things before and we've always survived, then we can give ourselves some room to take a little bit of the pressure off from having to get it right and being worried about getting it wrong and allow ourselves to just explore and to just play. And a lot can happen when we introduce that kind of space for ourselves. A little bit of the um, discomfort can be kind of continued when we're really trying to get it right. Totally. Like you're saying that I'm like, yep, mm -hmm, yep, yep. That is like definitely a female thing from the women that I've talked to that are designers, but I, maybe it's an artist thing too. this perfectionist idea of like, I have to get it right. I have to get it right. So it's like, if I'm going to move into, let's say this, this was actually a gentleman that said this, but he was going to move his business into home staging only. And maybe because he was a gentleman, he was less worried about what people think because we had a whole conversation in our group yesterday about this idea that we're always, we're so weak uh, um, as a community of women tend to be, and I am stereotyping, but it just seems to be true. We tend to be so concerned about what other people are thinking. And the men in our group said, yeah, yeah, I don't know. What is it about women? Because I don't feel that way. Um, and that's a whole other, that's a whole societal conversation. But um, but this idea of like, you have to get it right and perfect 
to be accepted, to be liked. And so if you're going to pivot your business like you did, like, I mean, you obviously went through this yourself. Like you moved from being this like shiny event planner giving out the Tiffany champagne glasses, which sounds very lovely uh, and could be could attract a certain type of client. And you moved away from that to something that maybe at the time felt like a big leap of faith. Uh, to being, you know, a very different person who's like invested in your client in a very different way and no longer giving away potentially those fancy uh, champagne flutes from Tiffany's. Um, So I I think, I mean, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but the idea is that it can be really scary because you're trying to get it right. Yeah. And you don't want to make the move until you figured it out fully. Yeah. Do you see that? Do you see that in people that they're like, I can't. I'm not ready to cut off this leg of my business because the other one hasn't been fully profitable yet. Yeah. Yeah. What I do see you this say to people all, who are trying so hard to get it right? I see this all the time. Um, so this is really, um, you know, I have a methodology in my coaching, which really has people tap into the full scope of their power and their infinite capacity for finding answers inside. And I can't stress enough how much we really do all come hardwired with our own answers and our own internal GPS But it is almost an unlearning that has to happen first in stopping looking outside of ourselves. So I have the answer. I have the process. And we literally do not have enough time to go through it on this show. But all I can say is that it is not uncommon. You are not alone if you are experiencing this feeling. And there is definitely a better way. I think especially right now with at this time in the world and this time in history, everyone is reevaluating where they're at in their business. Uh, Businesses are pivoting left, right and center, having to pivot, change, adapt. And I, I actually think that this is a really great time in history to make these changes. You know, it's it's time. It's, it's a safer time in some ways to make a change because everyone, if you care what everyone thinks, which obviously I do, um, but that everyone's kind of expecting it. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a lot of room to make the mistakes while you're making the transition now, right? Like mm-hmm. if you're pivoting to something, if you're getting into more of like the online course creation and all of that, like if the, you've achieved a certain level of success and all of a sudden you want to give back or not all of a sudden, maybe all of a sudden you have the time, you've had this desire bubbling up, but you were spinning your wheels before and running at an unsustainable pace maybe. And now you have the freedom and the room and the flexibility to create this thing that's really in your heart, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like, I mean, I definitely have the perfectionist side of me, right? Like the design driven, like that is there. And I call myself a recovering perfectionist because it does kind of flare up sometimes. I would like things to be shiny and perfect, but I also do recognize the value in learning the lessons when we're on the journey. You know, if I went, I mean, I created my first online course in two weeks, literally went into a cave for just two weeks, but not like what you hear a lot of online course creators doing, which is like six months before the course is ready. I did a live launch. I did it real time with my students and developing the curriculum. Like I had my outline, but I was doing it and responding to what was really resonating for them. And I learned so much about course creation in those two weeks. And that is the kind of stuff that then I was able to bring into my group coaching and my one-on-one coaching where I'm supporting people with my online portal and they have access to all the previous teachings and all of that. But if I had gone into the cave for six months, Months, I never would have like learned all of the things as quickly as I did. So sometimes done is better than perfect, right? And oh. th- that is really uncomfortable for a perfectionist, right? Who just wants it to look pretty and wants everybody to be inspired by it. And, you know, 
as long as the message is really, truly aligned, if you're really talking about the things that you believe the market wants, if you've done the research, if you've talked to your potential ideal clients and interviewed some people and gotten some language around what people are looking for, then you're ready to create that thing. Mm. Oh, I love that. So much wisdom. Uh, we can't keep talking. Otherwise, I totally would. Um, I love that. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to start. So good. Thank you, Andrea, for all your nuggets of wisdom today. Can you let everyone who's listening know where they can find you? Yeah. So the best place to find me is online. I've got a Facebook group. It's called the Up Level Collective. And that's a space where I support creative female entrepreneurs who are interested in scaling their business to six, seven figures and beyond. So, um, and really making that meaningful, lasting difference in the world through their business and um, aligning with every part of their life. So if that's a conversation people are interested in, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash up level collective. Awesome. I'm definitely going to check that out. I love everything that you're, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid girl. <laughs> yes. Come <laughs> join us. <laughs> it's all about dreams fulfilled over here. I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This was great. All right. That was really, really good. I mean, all I can think about is all the incredible ways that I want to improve my business right now. And and I really, what's sticking with me so much that Andrea talked about is what is the experience of our brand? And really turning it on its head and looking at it from that client perspective. Like how can we change and really overhaul the way she did with her own business? Like how do we overhaul what we're doing so we can speak to our clients at a deeper level and, and, and enhance their experience of working with us. I feel as though at the moment, my business, it's still, we're still struggling in the implementation for the renovations that are dragging on and the, and the construction, that whole element of it is, oh, I feel like it's dragging us all down. So I need to look at it differently. And I need to look at what is it in my own life, in my past even, that's potentially holding me back from really getting there getting to that next level. Uh, I hope you guys found this episode just as insightful as I did. Please be, um, please be, please be, I don't know what I was going to say there. Please go and follow her on all the places in the social, the Facebook group. Andrea Freeman, thank you. And guys, if you liked this episode, I know it was a little bit different than the typical design content. I would love to hear from you. Send me a DM on Instagram at Rebecca Hay Designs or, you know, just screenshot this podcast. Let others know that you enjoyed this episode so that we can keep creating the podcasts and the content that you like to listen to. That's it. I'll see you soon.